Tony's weekend was packed with odd jobs for his grandma's neighbours. On Sunday, his mum and grandma decided, because the sky was totally blue for the first time in a couple of weeks, that it was a good day for a picnic. After the picnic, they thought they were doing something nice for Tony by taking him to the Pizzaplex to play arcade games. Thoroughly unnerved by Crystal's warning, Tony was tense the entire time he and his mom and grandma were in the Pizzaplex. Although Tony didn't even look at the high scorers rosters, he couldn't get GGY out of his mind. When Tony spotted Glamrock Freddy watching him from the other side of the arcade, Tony pretended he didn't feel well, well sorry, and he asked his mum and grandma to take him home. Mentally, he called himself a wuss, but he figured even investigative journalists had a right to a tactical retreat once in a while. That evening, after his grandma- Oh god, what happened to my voice? It just disappeared. <laughs> it faded out of existence. Um, that evening after his grandma and mum went to bed, Tony started his story. He didn't get much done, though. Stressed out and tense, he managed to write just a page before he was too tired to keep try uh, typing. He'd have to wait until the next evening to get back to it. In spite of their num de plumes, Tony's friends had shown no interest in their story assignment, even when Tony told them about what he'd found. Just write what you think is best, Root Boots said after school on Monday. Then we'll put our two cents in. That was always how it went. Tony did the work and his friends threw in a few tidbits and they all shared a grade equally. Tony liked to write, so he didn't mind too much. Tony's fingers flew over the keyboard Monday evening, Tuesday evening and Wednesday evening. He could barely type fast enough to keep up with his ideas. GGY had a plan, Tony wrote, and it was a plan they weren't going to share with anyone. Working behind the scenes, wraith-like, worming their way into the dark maze of the Pizzaplex's restricted areas, GGY left only the subtlest trail behind. Did they leave the trail on purpose, teasing anyone who dared to follow their convoluted intentions? Or were they so overconfident in their clearly superior hacking abilities that their carelessness left the occasional faint footprint? Tony wove what he thought was a great story around the mystery of GGY's high scores on the arcade games and GGY's alterations to the animatronics. After GGY adjusted the animatronics code, Tony wrote, they became their new leader. Fazbear Entertainment may have thought the animatronics were in their control, but they weren't. The Glamrock stars of the Pizzaplex, Freddy and Chica and, Mont and, Mo and Roxy and Monty, sorry, continued to act normally most of the time, but in truth, under the facade of their normal duties, they were becoming GGY's minions. It was just after 10pm on Wednesday when Tony wrote the last lines of the story. So the simple curiosity of how one person managed to outscore, by the millions, all the other players in the Pizzaplex arcades, turned out to be so much more. GGY infiltrated the Pizzaplex so thoroughly that the complex became their playground. What GGY and their obedient animatronics do there now, furtively moving in and out of the shadows, avoiding security guards and cameras, is something only GGY knows. Tony stretched his fingers, then he typed the end. Saving his document, Tony closed the laptop before he could start picking apart his work. He was never fully satisfied with his words and he'd learned that he could tinker them indefinitely if he didn't force himself to stop and call the story done. Tony leaned back and stretched his arms over his head. He bent his fingers and cracked his knuckles. Then he stood so he could get ready for bed. He was wiped out. When Tony was writing, his concentration tuned out of the world. His mother had often told him that aliens could come through his window and throw a party in his room while Tony was writing and he wouldn't notice. That might have been a little bit of an exaggeration, but it wasn't too far off. Now that Tony was out of his writing zone, he heard his grandma's TV blasting as usual. Tony hummed along with the familiar potato chips jingle. When the commercial was over, the news anchor started talking. Tony could hear the man's deep voice intonating, or intoning, sorry, the family of Mary Schneider, the school counsellor who disappeared nearly five months ago, has made another appeal to law enforcement and the public. Tony frowned. A memory was trying to clamour out of the thick stew of thoughts in his brain. What was it? A breathy and a high-pitched woman's voice replaced the news anchor's voice on Tony Grandma's TV. Our Mary wouldn't have just taken off, the woman said. Something happened to her. Please, if you know anything. Come forward. The sound of hiccuping sobs replaced the words, and the news anchor's voice took over. Police say they currently have no leads, he said. 
and they welcome any and all information that might help them find the missing woman. Poor Mrs. Schneider, Tony thought. Everyone in the school had known Mary Schneider. Even though Tony had never met with her, he'd seen her in the halls. A pretty woman who had worn round wire-framed glasses, Miss Schneider had always had a smile on her face. Tony had thought she had looked like a nice lady. Tony shook his head and yawned. He still felt like there was something he needed to remember, but he was too tired to figure it out. Maybe I'll think of it in the morning, Tony thought as he headed to the bathroom to brush his teeth. They're teasing us! <laughs> they are teasing us! When Tony and his friends met at their lockers before classes started the next morning, Tony gave Boots and Rab each a copy of his story. Boots looked at the title page. The Mysterious GGY by Boots, Mr. Rabbit and Tarbell, Boots read. He grinned. The title and num de plumes alone should get us an A. Boots wasn't completely wrong. Although Mrs. Soto didn't have the best sense of humour, she did seem to like the fact that Tony and his friends always used interesting pen names. She also often said that a good title was an important part of a good story. The last story they'd handed in, which had been about kids breaking into school after dark to look for hidden bank robbery loot rumoured to be hidden in the basement, had been titled The Loot in the Suit. Mrs. Lo uh, Mrs. Soto had loved the rhyme. Tony wondered what she would have thought if she'd known that the loose basement window that gave the story's characters access to the school in the story was based, in a way, on fact. Tony and his friends had found a barely noticeable crack in the school's foundation, and when they'd investigated, they discovered they could wriggle loose some of the limestone to squeeze in next to a basement window. They'd only broken in once, just for the fun of it. As far as they knew, no one else was aware of the hidden access, and there was no real loot down there. Or suit, for that matter. Soot, I don't know. Suit or suit. Uh, a suit or suit, I don't, I don't care. Um, <laughs> Tony looked at Rab to see what he thought of the title, but Rab's expression was unreadable. Rab stuck the story in his backpack. I'll look at it later, he said. As Tony and his friends wove through the other kids in the school's crowded hallway, Boots started reading the story. Twice, Tony had to grab Boots' arm and pull him aside to keep him from colliding with other kids. What do you think? Tony asked Boots. Don't know yet, Boots said. He raised his head and flipped through the typed pages. I assume it picks up as it goes along. Tony frowned. He thought the story started at a good pace. It raised all sorts of questions on the first page. Tony was tempted to say that Boots shouldn't criticise something he didn't do any work on, but he kept his mouth shut. Before they went into the history classroom on the school's second floor, Tony said to his friends, I have to mow some lawns this afternoon and paint Mr. Browning's new man cave this evening. Can we meet early to work on any changes you guys think we need? Mrs. Soto's assignments always had to be turned in by morning bell on the day they were due, which was the next day. If Rab and Boots wanted changes, Tony would have to scramble. Rab shook his head. Sorry, no can't do. I'm going to be late tomorrow. Rab and I will work on it this evening, Boots said. I'll be fine. Or oh, it'll be fine. Tony gritted his teeth. He decided he was getting a little tired of this writing partnership. He might have to talk to Mrs. Soto about it before the next assignment. Tony was nearly finished painting the Browning's basement, aka Mr. Browning's man cave, what Tony thought was a very depressing beige, when he suddenly remembered what had been nagging him the night before. Tony's paint roller froze mid-stroke. Mary, Tony said. He's, st he's stiff. Oh, sorry, th there's a gap between stiff and lead, so it says stifled, but... It looks like he's stiff lead. He stifled a sneeze. His sinuses were clogged by paint fumes and the dust from under the drop cloths he spread over piles of Mr. Browning's old books and sports memorabilia. Tony stepped back from the wall by the stairs leading up to the Browning's main floor. He watched a drip start to run down toward the baseboard. His gaze went to the floor and that triggered a memory of squatting on the floor in the Pizzaplex kiosk. Tony stepped forward and swiped his roller over the drip as he thought about the name that he'd seen on the computer in the Pizzaplex kiosk. One of the people GGY's hacked play pass had led into the Pizzaplex after hours was someone named Mary. Why hadn't Tony put that together the night before, when he'd heard the news report? Because he'd been tired. Only half paying attention to what he was doing now, Tony uh, dipped his roller in the paint. He slapped the paint on the wall and spread it around haphazardly. Could the Mary that GGY had let into the Pizzaplex have been Mary Schneider, the missing counsellor, 
Tony shook his head. Mary was a very common name. GGY could have let a friend in named Mary. Um, assuming that Mary was the missing counsellor, or assuming that Mary was the missing counsellor was crazy. It's a leap, Tony muttered. But was it really? If Tony's suspicions were right, GGY was up to something in the pizzaplex. Crystal had said she thought so too. She didn't care about what GGY was doing, but Tony did. What if GGY had something to do with the missing counsellor? That's a whole new story, Tony said to himself. He grinned. He might be onto something really big. Now, in a hurry to finish up his job so he could concentrate on his realisation, Tony began swiping paint over the wall as fast as he could. He was glad he only had a few square feet of bare wall yet to cover. What if Tony was right? What if Mary Schneider was one of the people GGY's hacked play pass had let into the pizzaplex after closing? Why would GGY have wanted Mary Schneider to come to the pizzaplex? Tony finished the wall. He stepped back and looked for more drips. When he didn't see any, he quickly put the lid on the paint can and rushed to clean up the roller in the utility sink on the other side of the basement. Mr. Browning had to share his domain with his wife's laundry room. Tony had just done the man cave's first coat so he didn't have to clean up the drop cloths right now. In less than five minutes, Tony was back on the main floor of the house, saying goodbye to the Brownings. I'll be back tomorrow evening to do the second coat, he called as he flew through the Brownings overcrowded living room. Mr. and Mrs. Browning, both heavy set and kind faced in their 60s, were settled in their side by side easy chairs. Their huge scrap flat screen TV was blasting the play by play of a college basketball game. Mr. Browning was watching the screen intently. Mrs. Browning, a furrow of annoyance, crimped between her brows, was knitting something big and, pri and bright pink. Looking at her expression, Tony couldn't help but remember what Mrs. Browning had said when she had hired Tony to paint the basement. Mr. Browning needs a man cave, she had said, so I don't have to kill him. <laughs> she had said the words with a playful smile, but when she'd explained how she had had to it up to here, uh, so, uh, sorry, but when she'd explained how she'd had it up to here, with sports blasting in her living room every night, Tony had a feeling that the man cave just might save Mr. Browning's life. Tony was halfway out the Browning's front door when Mrs. Browning called out, Bye now, dear. In the muted yellow glow of the Browning's pole light, Tony jogged toward his bike. The rain had returned, but it was falling softly tonight. It wasn't much more than a mist, which actually felt good on Tony's face. Oh yeah, I love, I love that kind of weather. Uh, where it's like light raining, but it's like a, a misty rain. It's I love that. It's ah, oh, oh, it's the best weather. Um, the Browning's basement had been stuffy and warm. Tony gratefully breathed in the cool, musky air as he pulled his little flashlight from his pocket. I don't know why I said it like that. He probably wouldn't need to bike home, but he liked having it handy. Tony got on his bike, and his brain continued to churn. Think. Tony mentally commanded. He had to piece it together logically. Tony got on his bike and coasted down the Browning's driveway. Okay, he said to himself as he started to pedal. I think GGY is a kid. If they're a kid, they probably go to my school. If they go to my school, they probably knew Mary Schneider. So what? Tony thought. Knowing Mary Schneider didn't mean anything. Most of the kids at the school had either known her or known of her. But what if GGY had known Mary Schneider and they'd had a problem with her? Mrs. Browning's voice played in Tony's head, so I don't have to kill him. Tony braked to a sudden stop on the gravel verge just a quarter mile from his grandma's house. He straddled his bike and thought hard. He had to find out more about Mary Schneider, but how? Tony looked down the road. He could see the exterior lights of his grandma's house through the drizzly darkness. He could also see the light in his grandma's bedroom window. It was late. She'd be watching her TV. Tony's mum would be asleep. They never checked on him before they went to bed. Tony looked back over his shoulder toward town. Pressing his lips together, he made a decision. He turned his bike and began pedalling away from his house. It wasn't until he tucked his bike against the back wall of the school that Tony started to worry that maybe someone had discovered the hidden way into the building. It had been several weeks since he and his friends had found and used it. If the groundskeeper had seen the crack and repaired it, Tony wouldn't be able to do what he wanted to do, but Tony's worry was unnecessary. When Tony scuttled past the bushes that lined the back of the, the school and walked flat-footed in an attempt to be quiet that totally failed, over the gravel near the school's foundation, he was relieved to see that the crack was still there, the limestone could still be moved. 
In just a few minutes, Tony had shoved aside the grainy stone blocks and squeezed through the barely wide enough hole between them. The stone, when Tony shifted it, smelled faintly of rotten eggs. Tony knew from science class that this was because the rocks, when rubbed together, emitted sulfurated hydrogen. I, I know about sulfurated hydrogen. Yeah, sure. Sulfur? It's like yellow, in it? <laughs> hydrogen, helium, lithium, brilliant, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Um, like that's important right now, Tony muttered softly as he dropped to the school basement's smooth cement floor. Standing still under the flickering glow of a low watt security light, Tony listened. Through the hole he'd come through, he could hear the rain's faint patter. Inside the basement, something was dripping even louder than the raindrops. Beyond the drip, a low hum was punctuated by a quiet rhythmic kick. Normal sounds, Tony told himself. The last time Tony had snuck into the school, he'd had, he'd had his friends with him. Being alone, he discovered, was a little scarier. Tony had to clamp down his normal active imagination as he crept past the lumpy hulk of the school's furnace and several stacks of dusty boxes and crates. Climbing the steep stone stairs that led from the basement to the school's main floor, Tony told himself that what he was about to do would be a piece of cake, and totally worth it. On the bike ride to school, Tony had decided that his best chance of accessing the school's records was via Mrs. Hawkins' computer. Mrs. Hawkins, the grandmotherly librarian with a pun-heavy sense of humour and seemingly endless energy, had an office, not much more than an alcove, near the back of the school library. It wasn't a space that could be locked, so her computer could be easily accessed. Tony had worked with Mrs. Hawkins on so many projects. He was one of her favourites, or so she said, because he was so curious and eager. She often had him join her in her office so she could help him research. Because of this, Tony knew Mrs. Hawkins' password. She tended to be pretty obvious about typing it in. Although the school was an uh, yeah, sorry. Although the school was ancient, Tony knew that it had some internal security. That security, however, was sparse, and Tony, because his curiosity made him aware of all sorts of little details, knew where the cameras were. He could easily avoid them. It took Tony only a few minutes to get from the school basement to Mrs. Hawkins' office, making sure he kept his head low, uh, sorry, his head below the checkout counter before he entered her office, he duck-walked until he knew he was past the range of the library's CCTV. When Tony took a seat in Mrs. Hawkins' white leather desk chair, sorry, then Tony took a seat, um, Tony scooted the chair toward Mrs. Hawkins' antique desk. The desk's wood was very dark. It looked almost black in the unlit office. Tony pulled out his flashlight and shone it on Mrs. Hawkins' keyboard. He quickly typed in her password, Shelley and Petey. Of course, she used her names of her two grandchildren. Um, as soon as Tony was into Mrs. Hawkins' hard drive, he was uh, sorry. He searched for the school's personnel records. He wanted to find out everything he could about Mary Schneider. Tony quickly found the personnel records. They were organised by position. He clicked on counsellors. Within the counsellors file, Tony found a list of counsellors and then separate documents for each counsellor, current and past. Mary Schneider's file jumped out at him immediately, but before he, clicked, he could click on it, his gaze landed on the counsellor list. His hand froze on the mouse. Tony leaned toward the computer screen. The counsellor list was long, but each name had a date to indicate the counsellor's tenure at the school. Only four of the names had dates within the last couple of years. Tony figured those were the only ones that were relevant. The Pizzaplex wasn't even around before then. The first name on the list for the dates in question was Mary Schneider's. After her came Raylan Lawrence and Trina Welsh. Then Georgia Lowe. She was the current counsellor. Next to each name, two dates noted the time that the counsellors worked at the school. Mary Schneider had worked there the longest. She'd started three years before she disappeared. Tony read the other dates. He raised an eyebrow as he studied them. Raiden Lawrence had replaced Mary Schneider, and she'd only worked there a month. Trina Welsh had been the next counsellor, and she'd lasted just seven weeks. The school had been without a counsellor for a few weeks. Georgia Lowe had just started a month before. I have my mouth shut. <laughs> I have my mouth shut. Uh, why hadn't Tony noticed that the school had been going through counsellors so quickly? He shrugged. He had no reason to notice because he never met with them. Tony rubbed his temple. Some memory was prodding at him again. What was it? Tony clicked on Mary Schneider's file. There wasn't much to it. Just a resume, a few performance reports, and a summary page. Tony skimmed through everything quickly. 
Although the summary page noted under reason for exit that Mary Schneider was missing disappearance under investigation, nothing else in the file was remotely interesting. Tony backtracked and clicked on Raylan Lawrence's file, which was similarly sparse. Tony clicked on the summary page. He sucked in his breath. Raylan's reason for exit was identical to Mary's. She was missing too. Why hadn't Tony known that? Had it been on the news and he'd missed it? That's so not a coincidence, Tony whispered. Tony quickly brought up Trina Welsh's file. His heart rate was picking up speed. He felt a trickle of sweat run down the back of his neck. Swiping it away, Tony opened Trina's summary page. He sucked in his breath. Trina was missing too. Tony clicked back to the list of names. Three out of the four women listed were missing. Why hadn't that been mentioned on the news report about Mary Schneider that Tony had heard the other night? He tapped his fingers on Mrs. Hawkins' desk. Maybe the school was trying to keep it quiet. He could sure understand it if they were. Tony stared at the women's names. What had happened to... Tony blinked as the memory that had been nagging at him finally revealed itself. Tony's mind suddenly provided him with a mental snapshot of what he'd seen on the Pizzaplex kiosk computer. His mental freeze frame showed him the last, or sorry, the first three letters of the other two people's GGY's play pass had let into the Pizzaplex after hours. Those letters had been Ray, R-A-E, and Trey, T-R-E, Raylin and Trina. Tony suddenly felt like his skin was trying to cool out of his body, or off his body. <laughs> His breath was coming in rapid little gasps. A thousand times not a coincidence, Tony whispered to himself. Somewhere in the old school building, something chittered. A mouse, maybe? Or something else? Outside, the wind was picking up. Tony could hear its pressing sigh against the window panes behind him. Wanting to be out of the school, Tony quickly explored the rest of the school's records. He was hoping to find a list of students who'd met with the counsellors. He thought he might spot a student with the initials GGY on the list. But if such a list existed, it wasn't in the files Tony could access. After another 10 minutes, he gave up. Tony returned to the list of counsellor names. His mind was zinging through what he knew, and he didn't know, at 100 miles per hour. GGY had to have something to do with the counsellor's disappearances, Tony concluded after just a little thought. It made perfect sense. But why would GGY have done anything to the three, three women? That's easy, Tony thought. The counsellors must have met with GGY, and maybe, one by one, they'd caught on to whatever GGY was doing at the Pizzaplex, and maybe other places too. Who knew what GGY was capable of? Clearly, they were brilliant. Brilliance could be used for good and bad. Tony asked himself one of his favourite questions. What if? What if the counsellors had discovered what GGY was doing, and what if they'd known they were onto them? What if they'd lured them somehow to the Pizzaplex to do away with them? Tony snorted. It sounded so out there that when he ran it through his head. Uh, but then again, if Mrs. Browning could even playfully suggest killing her husband of over 40 years because his sports watching annoyed her, couldn't a brilliant kid who was doing something illegal possibly kill to cover what she was doing or what he was doing, sorry? It was wild, sure, but it was totally possible. Tony had heard far more outlandish things on the news. Tony shook his head. He was missing so many facts. He couldn't possibly fill in the gaps with what he currently knew. He'd have to do more digging. Because if he didn't, who else would figure out what GGY was doing? If someone had dug more into the embezzlement Tony's dad had been convicted of, maybe Tony's dad wouldn't be in jail. Tony didn't think getting to the facts should be an option. It had to be a necessity. Tony had to get to the truth of what GGY was doing. GGY was no longer just some kid who got high scores and hacked the Pizzaplex for jollies. No, Tony thought. Something far more malicious and probably dangerous was going on. Deep in the belly of the old building, something clunked. Tony stood so fast that Mrs. Hawking's chair shot backward behind him. That was enough. Tony needed to get out of there. The next morning, Boots met Tony on the school's wide front steps. Today, with the sun was shining. Its warmth hit the moisture from the previous night's rain, and steam wafted up from the staircase's pale stone. You're not going to believe what I found out, Tony said as soon as he saw his friend. Tony grabbed Boots' arm and pulled him away from the chattering kids who streamed into the school. A few feet away, bus brakes hissed and car engines revved. Several kids shouted to their friends. Bursts of loud uh, laughter punctuated all the commotion. Last night, I... Tony began. We added some stuff to the story. Boots interrupted. 
Tony closed his mouth and scowled at the sheaf of papers Boots held out to him. Like what? Tony asked. Go ahead and read it, Boots said. Okay, everybody, uh, listen out. Listen out for this. This is going to be important. He glanced at his watch. You have about 15 minutes before we need to hand it in. Tony quickly began to scan the opening of the story. He found the first change near the bottom of page one. Gigi Y was the wizard's most favoured apprentice? Tony yelped when he read the line that had replaced Tony's description of Gigi Y's high arcade game scores. Cool, huh? Boots said. Rab came up with that. Keep going. It gets better. After reading the second page of the story, which described a corporate conspiracy that somehow reached another planet where the wizard resided, Tony's head began to throb. When he saw his description of Gigi Y's control over the animatronics had turned into an animatronic supervillain that went into battle with a tentacled monster, Tony was pretty sure his ears were emitting steam similar to what was swirling along the surface of the step he stood on. Tony's head was filled with a roar that blocked out all the other noise around him. The words on the page, which got more and more outrageous the more he read, began to blur. They'd ruined his story! There you go. <laughs> important! S such important information! Tony had written a super awesome story based on a true life mystery, and his friends had taken all the realism out of it. They transformed the story from something believable and therefore creepily eerie, to something utterly bizarre and therefore not the least bit disturbing. Frantic to fix what his friends had done, Tony pulled out a pen and started to scribble on the first page. They get marked down for having handwritten changes, he knew, but at least he could maybe get the story to- Dude, Boots said, what are you doing? Look at the time. Tony glanced at his watch. The bell was going to ring. They had to turn in the story now, or they'd get an F. Flinging a glare at his friend, Tony ran up the steps and into the school. He had barely a minute to reach the third floor and hand in the story. He figured they'd be lucky to get a C on it, but a C was better than an F. You're welcome, Boots called after Tony. No, not Boots, Tony thought. Ellis, Tony's idiotic friend, did not deserve to have a num de plume ever again. From here on out, Boots would be Ellis, as far as he was concerned. <clears throat> Guys, if you haven't figured out the relevance of the story yet, I question you. <laughs> I question you. Tony stewed about his uh, th trashed story through all of first period. When, his, when the bell rang, sorry, he didn't even look at Ellis as he stood and headed out of the room. He was aware that Ellis followed him, though. Tony was striding out into the hallway when he heard his name over the school's loudspeaker. Tony Becker, a woman's voice crackled. Please report to Mr. Adkins' office immediately. Tony looked up at the speakers and frowned. Dude, Ellis said. What did you do? Tony shook his head. Turning his back on his friend and ignoring the curious looks he got from his other classmates, Tony hurried through the packed hallway to the stairs. There, he trotted down to the main level and went directly to the glass-walled administrative offices. The chairs lining the wall of the offices were empty, and only Mr. Adkins' secretary, petite and sour-faced Mrs. Logan, stood behind the wood counter that separated a dingy waiting area from a cramped space filled with filing cabinets, desks, and heavy tables, or tables heavy, with computers, a fax machine, and a photocopier. Miss Logan spotted Tony and motioned with her jutting chin toward Mr. Adkins' closed office door. Tony didn't bother to acknowledge Miss Logan as he normally would have. He was too preoccupied with trying to figure out why he'd been called to the principal's office. <laughs> I wonder! Tony pushed Mr. Adkins' door open and stepped into the big square room that was lined with heavy, dark shelves stuffed full of books and photographs. He looked across the massive, shiny cherry wood desk at the huge man... Uh, who ran their school. With dark hair, olive skin, and strong features, Mr. Adkins looked a little like a mafia don. Or at least Tony thought so. You wanted to see me, sir? Tony said. Mr. Adkins, whose suit coat was thrown over the back of his chair, had his collar unbuttoned, tie loosened, and sleeves rolled up. Um, raising an almost ogre-sized hand, he motioned to one of the two straight-backed wood chairs in front of his desk. Sit he said. Tony did as he was told. It has come to my attention, Mr. Adkins said as soon as Tony sat, that you snuck into Mrs. Hawkins' office last night. Tony's eyes widened. H how? The question was one he was asking himself, but he said it out loud. How did I find out? Mr. Adkins asked. Tony nodded. Mr. Adkins licked his thick lips. 
His gaze flicked the books on the shelf to his right. He leaned forward and squinted at Tony. You were caught on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Adkins said. He's lying, Tony thought. Tony knew where the cameras were. He'd stayed clear of them. But he couldn't say that, obviously. All he could do was hang his head and mumble, sorry. But if Tony wasn't caught on camera, how had he been seen? Had someone else been in the school? Tony had a really weird feeling that he hadn't been alone in the school last night. The thought made his stomach lurch. When Tony looked at Mr. Adkins' narrow-eyed expression, Tony's weird feeling turned into certainty. Tony had been watched, and his watcher had ratted him out. But who was it? What in the world did you think you were doing? Mr. Adkins said. His rubbery features tightened as he speared Tony with a scathing look. That wasn't a question Tony was going to answer. So he mumbled again. It was just a stupid dare, he lied. Mr. Adkins sighed. He leaned forward and flipped through an open file on his desk. Tony read upside down. It was his file. You had a clean record, Mr. Adkins said. Good grades. He leaned back and put muscular arms behind his head. Sweat stains darkened the light blue fabric of his shirt under his arms. Tell you what, Mr. Adkins said. After school, you'll go back to the library for detention. You can explain to Mrs. Hawkins why you violated her space, and you can also do whatever tasks she deems appropriate. Capiche? Tony nodded. When Mr. Adkins waved him away, Tony meekly left the office and went to his locker to get his books for the next class. Mrs. Hawkins was surprisingly calm about the way Tony had violated her space. In fact, she acted somewhat conspira conspiratorial. <laughs> conspiratorial when Tony reported to her after school. I bet you were doing some kind of research, she said, winking at Tony. Right? Right, Tony said. He was relieved that he could tell the truth. But I'm sorry, it wasn't nice to get on your computer like that. Pish posh, Mrs. Hawkins said. If that's the worst you have in you, the world is in no danger. She nudged her, her, him with a sharp elbow. You know what they say, huh? Tony grinned, because usually this question was followed by a pun. No, he said dutifully. What? What you sees is what you get. Mrs. Hawkins squinched up her friendly round features and let out a snorting laugh. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, Tony smiled. <laughs> good one, he agreed. Mrs. Hawkins pointed at four tall stacks of books leaning against an, uh, one other end. Oh God. One uh, leaning against one another at the end of the Long Oak Library counter. It's been a long day. Uh, why don't you busy yourself reshelving these books? Tony nodded. Got it. He crossed the books and grabbed a few of them. Heading toward the shelves near the door to the hallway, Tony started scanning the rows for where the first book needed to go. Before he, spound, he found its spot, he heard his name being called. He looked up and scowled at the other culprit who had ruined his story. The story destroyer grinned at Tony. Boots said you weren't happy with the changes we made to your story, he said. Sorry we did so much to it. We might have gotten carried away, but we were just trying to make it more entertaining. Tony wanted to unload all the righteous indignation he'd been carrying around all day, but that wouldn't have accomplished anything. He'd learnt his lesson. He wouldn't be partnering with his friends on a story again. He'd find someone else in the class to work with. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Tony said with exaggerated politeness. Like Ellis, Tony was done calling Greg by his nickname, Rab. It was Greg from here on out. What? A twist. What a twist. <laughs> uh, when Greg didn't move off, Tony raised a hand and said, see you tomorrow. Greg returned the wave. He smiled. Then he cocked his head and studied Tony for several seconds. For some reason, Greg's scrutiny made Tony want to squirm. Before Tony could figure out why he'd suddenly felt odd, Greg started to walk away. Tony let out a pent-up breath. Greg stopped and took a step back toward Tony. Listen, Greg said. How about you meet me at the Pizzaplex when you get out of here? In an hour or so. I have some people I want you to meet. We'll have some fun, and you'll forget all about the story and getting detention. Tony wasn't all that keen on going back to the Pizzaplex. He couldn't be in the place now without thinking of GGY and the modified animatronics. Come on, Greg pressed. Say yes. We'll get you cheered up. And that's it. <laughs> oh, oh, congratulations for getting through the story of all time. Guys, if you haven't pieced it together, here's what happened. School counsellors, what are they? 
they are therapists. Who is who is Rab? Uh, A.K.A. Doctor Rabbit. Greg, A.K.A. Gregory, A.K.A. Patient Forty Six. That's right, everyone. Gregory is patient 46. Whether you like it or not, this is 100% confirmation and there is no getting out of this. Okay, this is what was intended. This is the story that is supposed to confirm it. And you may be unhappy, you may be unsatisfied, but I personally am super, super, super satisfied with this explanation. And I absolutely love what they have done here. This story is perfect for explaining that to us. And for just being a story, like, I think it's a really good story, actually. I think it's really well written. I think Tony is a, a cool protagonist, sort of, because he's kind of, like, he has he has his motivations with his dad and stuff, with, like, embezzlement, and he wants to be a journalist, and it's all, like, very well explained at the start. And I, I wasn't bored throughout the story. Like, there was no part where I was bored. Um, probably because I knew it was coming, but, like, Wow, what a mind blow. So, if you don't know how Gregory can be patient 46, I am going to tell you to just subscribe, okay? Just just trust in me, okay? Subscribe. And you're going to have to wait for a video that comes out very soon. It's going to be called something like, we need to talk about Gregory or something. Like, it's going to be something like that. It's going to be very obvious it's about Gregory. It's not going to spoil anything on the thumbnail or the title or anything like that. It's just going to be a, a video about Gregory, and in that we're going to talk about this story and all of the links, because there there's some really, really interesting stuff. The fact that Greg is called Dr. Rabbit is very interesting. You may be thinking what I'm thinking with that. Uh, and the fact that he, he is the sorcerer's favourite apprentice. That's interesting. Why is he the sorcerer's favourite apprentice? Who is the sorcerer? And what does all of this mean for Security Breach and the Ruin DLC? We are going to be talking about that in a separate video very, very soon coming to my channel. So make sure you subscribe for that. Anyway, I absolutely love this story. It is amazing. And believe it or not, the next story, the storyteller, is probably on the same level. <laughs> like, I think every story in this book is on the same level as what we just read. So be excited. I'll be making that audiobook. Uh, probably starting tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.